one of the things that I brought back from my wonderful trip to visit with family was the legacy of staying in a house with the condo for a week. So I'm getting over a cold. It's not COVID. They hadn't tested, which means that it counts for me too, because I didn't go anywhere else. Um, but um, please be patient if my voice is a little bit rougher than normal. It's almost over. I'd like to invite, invite you all to join in our gathering prayer and the Lord's Prayer, printed in your bulletin. Dear God, we thank you for this holy name, spacious enough to hold our rage, our joy, our wonder, and our grief. From generation to generation, this church has kept a covenant that binds heart to heart. And today, we again commit our hearts to you. Gather us in, like a parent calling all children home to share and grow our faith together. We pray in the pattern of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, we've so appreciated, Karen, the way that you have already been sharing your gifts, uh, your gifts of organization and communication, uh, reaching out to, uh, to help us stay connected in these challenging months. Um, Karen and I have enjoyed a, a shared uh, uh, interest and love in the work of Howard Thurman, uh, the great African-American theologian and poet and mystic who happened to be a friend of her mother's. Uh, so she has all kinds of great stories to share, um, and I'm joyful to have all three of you joining the congregation this morning. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, ask some questions that are part of our tradition. Uh, to, uh, in many ways, these questions echo the questions of baptism for those old enough to respond for themselves. Uh, but they are affirmations of the faith we share and the community we share. So you'll see the, the response, um, and uh, I, I'll ask you and you may respond together. So Lynn Marison and Chad Marison and Karen Jorgensen, do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, say, I promise with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith and be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence, and furthering Christ's mission in all the world? If so, say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. And do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves this community and the world? If so, say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Now I'd like to invite our deacons that are present to come forward. Brad sends his regrets. We're thankful that he's keeping his uh, germs in his own space this morning. <laughs> yeah. Now this is the, uh, the rest of the family participation part. You're not an audience because we are all active participants. Uh, but there is a part for all the members of this congregation to share in, and I would like to invite you to follow along. Let us, the members of Phippsburg Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. We welcome you with joy into the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love, and be witnesses to our risen Savior. And we have a token of our welcome for each of you, fresh from uh, some, some local yards here. <laughs> Also have Love. 
Welcome to the If we're like, say, we're say I'm a teacher, or we point at the chalkboard, or like when you're saying, oh, that's the person that was in my class, or something like that. Right. We use it to point, and and Jane mentioned we we use it to point at the chalkboard if we're trying to be a part of a discussion at school. And a pointer finger reminds us of all the people who point us in the right direction. So this is a special reminder with this finger to pray for leaders and teachers. So every time you think about praying with your hand, you've got your thumb for your friends and family, and then your pointer finger for all the leaders and teachers that you can pray for. Now, do you know what's wrong with this finger right here? It's, it's not finger. as strong as the rest of your fingers. Have you ever tried to carry something heavy with just one finger? Mm -hmm. We usually use this one, right, when we're trying to yeah. do that. You ever tried to carry something with your little finger? You yeah. Can do it, but it's kind of awkward. Yeah. And and you can kind of do it with this one, but it's not as strong as your pointer finger. But this finger, the way the muscles are connected, it's not as strong as the others. So this is the finger that reminds us of all of the the helpers that we need to think about. So this is the finger for people who help us when we're weak. 
for people who guide and serve, like firefighters and other first responders, um, for, um, for nurses and doctors, for people who come into your classroom to help, all those people who understand that we can't always do everything really well, and they're there to help us and help us feel better and get better um, both in our minds and our bodies. So for people who guide and serve and help us out when we're weak, we pray with this finger. Now, we've got this finger, and this finger, we know it as our ring finger. I've got, I've got one here. You might have one sometimes. It's a fun, it's a fun place to put a ring. The ring actually fits better on this finger than most of the others, so that's convenient. Um, so this finger is, uh, it's also, they say it's connected all the way to our heart. Like there's a, a funny little string that connects this all the way to our heart. That's why they put rings on it, because it's kind of special that way. So you can think about all the people who help your heart. All the people who give you courage when you're weary. All the people who help you when you're just tired out about everything. So when you feel weary, you can pray for the people who help you with that. And you can also pray for everybody else who's not feeling good. So think about all the people who need some help with their hearts. And all the people who are sad or lonely or just really having trouble with something. And you can pray for all of them. There's one finger left. It's kind of a little finger, but it's still really important. Do you know who you can remember to pray for with this one? Um, yourself. Yourself. You always should like. You always should like be nice, be kind to yourself, and not just. You should, obviously should care for others, but you also should care for yourself. Exactly. Jane could teach us all a lesson in how to pray. Because she said, it's important to take care of other people and think about other people, but you also need to take care of yourself and be kind to yourself. So that finger might be little, but it's still really important to, to work with all the others. So after praying for all these other people who are so important, we're important too. We're important to God. We're important to the church. And we're important to ourselves, to take care of ourselves and be good to ourselves. So that's the one that reminds us, no matter how little we are, we matter to God and we need prayers too. So you've got a built-in prayer reminder everywhere you go. You can color that and make the fingers whatever color you want them to be. And you can stick it in your favorite book and pull it out and remember. Uh, or put it somewhere else that you'd like to, to remember those things. So that's for you to take with you. And let's go ahead and have a prayer. Hey, we can go ahead and hold hands for this one. God, thank you for these beautiful hands, for thumbs, for pointer fingers, for middle fingers, for ring fingers, for little fingers, for all the things these hands can do, for all the ways they can help, for all the things they can hold, and for all of the prayers that they will help us through. God bless these hands, make them strong and gentle, and hold us all in your hands everywhere we go. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys want to play? There's some chalk, and I think that place outside needs some decorating. <laughs> Maybe you can even draw a really big hand out there to help us all remember how to pray. If anybody else would like a prayer reminder with the fingers, I have extras. Well, continuing on with our time of prayer this morning, 
Uh, I invite you to share with me these old, old words that hold us in a time of prayer. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right to give God thanks and praise. I give thanks and praise for this family of faith, for all of the hands that reach out in this place, for all of the things that we hold. Those things are not always easy burdens, but we do share them, and that is indeed a blessing. I'm thankful today for the joy of visiting with my family and celebrating the second birthday of my little nephew and spending some time remembering my brother's life as well. We weren't able to have the whole memorial service because plane tickets are too expensive for everyone to be there. But we did have some wonderful gatherings to share stories and remember, and it was good for all our hearts. There are some other joys I want to lift up. Today, we celebrate the birthday of Terry Gray and upcoming uh, also birthdays for Lori Simpson uh, and Jeff Dietz this week and a couple of anniversaries in the church family this week, which it seems to include me. Um, so um, I am grateful to be celebrating this coming week with my wife Sue. Uh, and Wayne and Marcia Beach are also celebrating. Um, so happy anniversary, uh, and may there be many more years of blessings for all of you. We lift up those who are walking the journey with someone else they love. We lift up those who are struggling with the greater questions of life and death, and all who feel the weight of hard anniversaries, those who wrestle with the trauma and terror that still haunt us, from the violence of September 11th, 2001. I also invite prayers for our sisters and brothers who are battling mental illness, made harder by the challenges of these days. With all of these prayers named and unnamed, I invite you to bring all that you are and all that you long for to the God who hears us even before we ask. Let us be held together in God's embrace in silent prayer. God of all nations and peoples. We remember and we lament. Comfort us, O Holy One, as we cry out to you. We remember the tragedy that happened 20 years ago on September 11th. We remember the smoke and the shock and the fear. Two decades have come and gone and the world is still full of hurt and pain. On this day, we remember that Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We confess that when we are in the middle of our hurt and pain, we often do not feel blessed. 
As we drown in sorrow, we do not feel comfort. It is all we can do to gasp for air. Sometimes grief is a fierce agony that rips at our souls. Other times it is the steady, throbbing ache of constant sorrow. We cry out to you as we remember. We remember that other countries have known loss and sorrow. We are not the only ones who mourn. We remember how natural disaster has left its mark on many nations. And we cry out when we hear how we small humans have broken the delicate balance of your creation. We pray for all those everywhere who have lost someone they love. For those who struggle with the pain and sorrow caused by the pandemic. For those who live in places that are constantly torn apart by war. Creator of all things, hear our prayers and shower mercy upon us. Although we lament in different languages, the pain that we feel is the same. Only you can ease this hurt. Only you can turn our mourning into beauty and transform our burdens into blessings. We remember, O oh Lord, and we pray. We have two scripture readings this morning, and they are both personifications of wisdom from different books in scripture, one with which many of us are familiar, the book of Proverbs, and another that not as many of us have seen because it doesn't show up in every Bible, and yet the ancient fathers of the church, the very first writers of the Christian faith, Many of them mentioned this as being a book of scripture in wide circulation in their time. You can find a book called The Wisdom of Solomon, included uh, in some, some types of Bibles, particularly the Catholic Bible includes it uh, in a section in the middle with the other wisdom literature. Um, and this was a book that was probably written about a century before Jesus lived. So, it's quite likely that he was familiar with this poetry as well. So we'll hear two different understandings of the character of wisdom. Okay, I'm reading from the uh, Common English Bible, and it's on page 490 if you want to follow along. And like a lot of uh, scripture reading, you really need to read the beginning, the first few verses before you get to the, to the meat of the, of the article here. But the section that I'm reading about is, is listen to women wisdom. Wisdom shouts in the street. In the public square, she raises her voice. Above the noisy crowd, she calls out. At the entrances of the city gates, she has her say. How long will you foolish people love your naivety? Mockers, hold your mocking gear, and fools hate knowledge. You should respond when I correct you. Look, I'll pour out my spirit on you. I will reveal my words to you. I invited you, but you rejected me. I stretched out my hand to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored all of my advice, and you didn't want me to correct you. So I'll laugh at your disaster. I'll make fun of you when dread comes over you, when terror hits you like a hurricane, and your disaster comes in like a tornado, when the distress and oppression overcome you. Then they will call me, but I won't answer. They will seek me, but won't find me, because they hated knowledge and didn't choose the fear of the Lord. They didn't want my advice. They rejected all my correction. They will eat from the fruit of their way, and they will be full of their own schemes. 
The immature will die because they turn away. Smugness will destroy fools. Those who obey me will dwell securely, untroubled by the dread of harm. From the wisdom of Solomon, we have the kind of gentler version of wisdom. <laughs> For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and a genius of God's goodness. Although she is but one, she can do all things, and while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God. The Bible loves nothing so much as a person who gives good wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun. She excels every constellation of the stars. Compared to the light, she is found to be superior. For it is succeeded by the night, but against wisdom, evil does not prevail. She reaches mightily from one end of the earth to the other, and she orders all things. There you have it. Wisdom. Bad cop, good cop. <laughs> <laughs> Those readings were both part of the lectionary uh, list for this particular Sunday in our cycle of scripture readings. And I couldn't help but notice the contrast uh, of, uh, uh, of narrations and try to imagine what was going through the mind of the poet when each of those were written down, what was swirling around them um, and that led to that characterization of wisdom as human. Please join me in prayer. Oh God, we do come to you seeking wisdom in whatever form, in the people around us and in your shining word among us. May these words move us to consider and weigh our own words, and may our testimony lift up the wisdom that shines forth from you. <clears throat> Mr. Rolfko, he needs your help getting ready for Thanksgiving. <laughs> the, the, the whole wind of the Holy Spirit is just busy today. <laughs> well, I was puzzled because hadn't I just turned the calendar on to September? What kind of preparation could need so much help and lead time? I took off my boots and washed the garden dirt off my hands and went to the phone. Mr. Rolf had been the town treasurer as long as I had known him and selectmen long before that. He found a great deal of meaning in serving our town and serving it well. He loved being a man who would show up reliably when needed. He also loved teasing my wife during her term on the select person's board. He called her a liberal granola cruncher <laughs> and followed up by bringing her granola bars on a regular basis. <laughs> when he retired from his service to the town, he left her a copy of Rush Limbaugh's book with a post-it note with a smiley face. <laughs> well, it turns out that for the first time in years, Mr. Rolf was going to be hosting Thanksgiving at his house, and he wanted to make a good impression on his kids, and his extended family. 
So it wasn't just ironing the good linens and scrubbing the bathroom and mopping the floors. Mr. Rolf was a chain smoker, and he wanted help scrubbing decades of nicotine stains off of the old farmhouse walls. Yes, yeah, September was a good time to begin. <laughs> well, my second day there, I got an early start. The huge cook stove was already radiating heat. And this was the day he wanted me to iron the linens. The ironing board, iron, and spray bottle were already set up and waiting. And same as every day, CNN was glaring. We don't have a television in our household by choice, and we get our news from papers and radio stations, so it was jarring to me, but Mr. Rolf liked to keep it on so he could check the stock ticker at the bottom of the screen. Thoughtfully, he'd set up the ironing board so that I could watch too. <laughs> and that's how I saw it happen in real time as the first plane and then the second flew into the Trade Center Towers. We witnessed it together, the retired town treasurer in his favorite chair by the television, and me standing between hot iron and wood stove. We watched as the planes hit and the newscasters tried desperately to make sense of it, we watched as our nation began to react and pivot. What does the poet say of wisdom? She orders all things well. Well, Mr. Rolf certainly had that kind of wisdom. If he hadn't been so conservative, if he hadn't so wisely shepherded his funds, he might not have hired me. And if he hadn't, I never would have seen it all happen. And if he hadn't hired me, each of us might have spent that morning alone instead of watching and witnessing and sharing that space together. In the days that followed, I scrubbed my way from one room to another while the smoke continued to rise and the ash continued to raise down. Each of you has your own stories of those days. Days of frantic phone calls or numb disbelief. Stories of people you know and the connections close or one removed or two from those who were in the plains and on the ground. Those who lived and died at ground zero. When I heard that the first registered casualty was Father Michael Judge, a fire department chaplain, I wanted to rage and scream at wisdom as she appears in the book of Proverbs. What do you mean threatening to turn your back on us in the middle of our terror and panic? Why didn't you protect this holy, faithful man? Why didn't you protect them all, the wise and the foolish? I wanted to rage again four days later when the hate crimes began. A man calling himself a patriot announced he was going to go and shoot some towel heads. And because he was himself wounded and not terribly wise, he aimed his weapon at the first turbaned man he saw, Balbir Singh Sodi a peaceful practitioner of the Sikh religion, quietly going about his work at the gas station he owned in Arizona. A man who had spent the previous few days encouraging the rest of the Sikh community there to join him in an upcoming public press event to teach their neighbors more about Sikh people and their faith, about their emphasis on peace, so they would not become targets of misunderstanding and hate. They say wisdom is one of the many names and faces of God. And because we are foolish and human, we can only imagine her to be a person something like us, 
sometimes gracious and loving, sometimes judgmental and harsh. Yet isn't that where hate begins? In the failures of our imaginations? And isn't it the greatest tragedy of our collective trauma that instead of making space for the enormity of our grief, instead of making space for rituals and weeping, the shared food and long conversations that lead us from death to life, we rushed headlong into acts of revenge. In the 20 years since that day, we must remember not only those who died then or as a result of their exposure to toxins in the aftermath, we must also remember soldiers killed, <coughs> wounded, and traumatized, victims of hate crimes targeting Muslims and those mistaken for them, and so many more. How many deaths can we trace to this one day and our national response? Scholars at the Cost of War Project at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs estimate the human toll at more than 890,000, including armed forces on all sides of the conflicts, contractors, civilians, journalists, and humanitarian workers. And that's not counting the hate crime victims, at least 300 in the Sikh community alone. The training of our spiritual imaginations is hard work, lifelong work, and it is meant to happen in community. And when our imaginations are well-trained and well-stoked, our vision expands. We can imagine wisdom not as some angry, proverbial scold, but as a power that renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and the prophets. For God loves nothing else as much as the person who lives with wisdom. In Balbir Singh Sodi's religion, as in ours, there is a challenge at the heart of faith, a challenge to respond in love even when we are sorrowing, suffering, betrayed, or enraged. We cannot help but respond imperfectly. Yet I have seen this church family rise to that challenge so many times. And in so many ways, in your acts of kindness and gestures of grace, in your honesty and generosity, I see love and love's wisdom shining forth. This is a community where grief and sorrow can be named, where long conversations can be held. This is a community that reckons with the complexities of history. This is a community that welcomes diversity. And now on this day, we have drawn the circle of family even wider. Here is more renewal. Here are more friends of God. Wisdom comes to us in so many forms, and when we hold space for each other and bear witness to one another, there is so much that is holy and good. I think of Valerie Kerr, a young Sikh woman who knew Balbir Singh Sodi so well that in her family they called him uncle. She tells of a turning point in her journey towards wisdom. It, he is the first of many to have been killed, but his story, our stories, barely made the evening news, she shares. I didn't know what to do, but I had a camera. I faced the fire. 
I went to his widow, Joginder Kaur, and I wept with her and I asked her, what would you like to tell the people of America? I was expecting blame. But she looked at me and said, tell them thank you. 3,000 Americans came to my husband's memorial. They did not know me, but they wept with me. Tell them thank you. Thousands of people showed up because unlike national news, the local media told about their uncle's story. Stories can create the wonder that turns strangers into sisters and brothers. So much has pulled us apart. There have been so many efforts in these 20 years to deepen our divisions. But with wisdom, there is much that has drawn us together. It's as true now as it was 20 years ago in a smoke-stained living room of an old farmhouse on the edge of town. If we make space for each other, for our shared vision and witness, we can help each other through and prepare for everyone else who might someday come to the table. If we plan it out, we'll have this place ready for Thanksgiving. We don't always know what the best thing is to do, facing all the challenges that life throws at us. But one thing that our faith has always taught us to do is to sing our way home. So I invite you to join with me in our closing hymn, affirming that we are the salt of the earth and we are bound for the city of God.
share your blessings and your resources to keep the circle of love flowing. In the basket at the back, there's a place to receive your offerings as we depart from this place. And now hear these words of benediction, a prayer for our collective memory. May you be an action and not an excuse, a horizon, not a hiding place, a warm nudge, not a wielded weapon, a threshold, not a wall. May you open wide enough to embrace our anguish and grow deep enough to invite our imaginations. May you upend our assumptions. May you tr transcend our consumption. May you spin grief into gumption. May you recollect us, reconnect us, remember and resurrect us until the past is not just blood on our hands, but blood that beats new rhythms in our hearts. Until the present is not just brokenness, but the work of breaking molds and living into new ways of being. Until the future is not just the next breath we hope will come, but the hopeful breath that we freely offer to everyone else. Until memory is not just a thing we pray not to lose, but the gift that is gained Every time our prayers push us to be more than memorials, more than our morning, more like the morning light that not only promises a new day, but sticks around to see it through. Go in peace. Um.